India's biggest food leaders, best food philosophies, genius culinary minds converge right here to share their master strokes for success. Welcome to Secret Sauce. I'm Govind Raj Ethiraj and on today's episode we have the legendary former executive chef of the Taj Group of Hotels, Hemant Oberoi. So they always say a chef never hangs up his boots and yet you seem to have transitioned from one phase of your life to another at a fairly at an age where some of your colleagues or contemporaries may really call you know may really think of hanging up their boots. My policy has been if you are tired you are retired. Okay. So that's how I moved on and um, I think this passion should never die. My philosophy was always that keep on giving back to this society and keep on creating. So what if you are done with one company, one must move on. I have uh, taken the inspiration from people like Joel Robuchon. Mm -hmm. At 63 or 64, he had his first restaurant. Mm. So why not? And you are opening a series of restaurants literally all over the world now. Uh, literally, I want to be there as a global player. Mm. And uh, first one we have done already in Singapore. And uh, it's called Yantra by Hemant Obroy. And the uh, second one is due in about uh, three to four weeks. It's in San Diego. And uh, hopefully the next destination should be Mumbai. One of the ways you seem to open restaurants or design new restaurants is preceded by travel. You go to Peru and then you find Peruvian food interesting and then you find a way of infusing Peruvian cuisine into your repertoire or actually setting up a restaurant. Yes, that's true actually. Um, the travel um, opens up my horizon actually in a very different way. And um, I get my thought processes right in, in the flights, actually. And the moment I'm going or coming back, most of the things are already frozen in my mind. Yes, and this is the next one. Then I start working on it. So in some ways, you're an accidental chef. That's not something that you actually decided to go out to become when you were a little boy in Firozpur. Yes, I never wanted to be. Uh, you know, every family in uh, North India wanted their uh, children to be either a doctor or an engineer or an army officer. These were the priorities. I wanted to be a doctor first. It didn't happen, Not didn't get enough good marks. And uh, probably sometimes it is the destiny also which plays an important role. And tell me about your family. What were they? I mean, what were they doing? What was your my, father doing, your mother? My dad was a station master in uh, railways. And um, I have one brother who was an engineer, two elder sisters. I'm the youngest one in the family. And then my parents thought I should become a doctor, didn't become one. Then went for UPSC and SSB interviews. Fell sick, didn't become a civil servant. <laughs> uh, <either. laughs> So on the way back, uh, my sister said, this is the hotel management course. Why don't you apply for it, entrance exam? I applied for it and got through. That in those days, it was a diploma, three years. I got through. This was in Delhi? Yeah, this was in Delhi, Posa. After that also, I didn't want to be a, <laughs> a uh, chef. In the last minute before the interviews, my head of the cookery department, I said, you can cook well. Why don't you become a chef? And they are looking for chefs. That's got a bright future. I said, first of all, this hotel line was enough. Then you become a chef. And chef, uh, those days was looked down upon. As a, the first thing was Bhavarchi, or a cook. Or a Khansama, as your or father always reportedly yeah. said. Yeah. So everybody you know, would have been. But then I don't know, in about, I think, 100 seconds, the whole life changed. I went inside for the interview. The interview was over there. This was also in Delhi. And from there, the life began. So once you entered, so even after you get into hotel management, you could choose different streams. And Absolutely. How, how did you choose yours or was it chosen for you? Or? I think it was properly, it was a guided missile which came. <laughs> <laughs> and just before the interviews, you know how every campus interviews are, some hotel people come, Obrois came, they interviewed, they said, okay, you join as a chef. Next day was Taj, or two days later it was Taj, and 
my head of cooked it. You stick to your, you become a chef. You will be a good chef. So Has Oberoi, you did not join because they said you should change your name, or you can't. Or your new. They name. did not write my name surname on the letter. They wrote, wrote only Hemant Kumar. So I said, where is uh, my surname? They said, you can't use your surname. I said, I don't want to be a, in a place where my identity is lost. So I attended uh, Taj interviews. So you joined the Taj. What what was your what were your first days like? So did, you must have done industrial training while you were at. at no, work. no, no. Oh. My industrial training were in absolutely cool places. It was in Mount Abu, Shirnagar, all those places there. And um, being a general secretary of the union in the college, uh, we had the options uh, of choosing a good places. Mm -hmm. So I really didn't work in the kitchens or anywhere to enhance my skills or anything, nothing like that. So it's only when you entered the Taj do you actually start doing yes, what you really uh, So what, what was your first assignment like? Do you, do you remember that? Or first few my assignment? first assignment was, uh, I must tell you that during the interview Mr. Kerkar asked me, or rather there's a person uh, sitting next to him, do you know how to make a pepper steak? I said no. And uh, we had never seen beef in those days in the colleges. They never used to show the beef or drum beef. I said, no. He said, do you know how to make a dosa? And in the institute, dosa was never made. <laughs> I said, no. He said, then what do you cook? I said, you ask me whatever has been taught from the curriculum, not dosa and pepper steak. And I said, if I knew everything, would I join you as a trainee? So they looked at me and one of the guys got very upset. He said, thank you gentlemen, thank you, we'll let you know. And outside, when the results were announced and uh, RMD was passing and he says, hey, you come to Mumbai. And here it was next day, I took the Rajdhani and I was in Mumbai. So, let me break for, for a moment and ask you something else. So if today a young chef uh, and you must have interviewed so many, thousands I imagine, give you the same answers, well, how would you react? Today the things have changed, I must tell you. Today, the knowledge which is through internet, the markets have opened up, so many things are available to be seen. And today they can't answer the same thing. Today the colleges have changed, the curriculums have changed, everything is being taught to you in four years time. In our times, it was not. It was very limited. It was limited to French cuisine and it was limited to the Indian cuisine. But that's interesting. I, I don't think it's a nugget which not too many people know that uh, it appears like Punjabis have always ruled the kitchens, but as you say, it's not. No, it wasn't. It wasn't the case. Obro's, it was only Bengalis. Hmm. Taj, it was only Goans. Okay. Hmm. And uh, Punjabis were slowly coming into the industry, but yet, my training period started. They gave me a paper. This is a schedule you are supposed to follow from one place to another. Nobody in those days used to bother where you are, where, what you have completed. Then after the first few months, I thought, if they are not bothered about me, why should I be bothered about sticking to the schedule? So I wanted to be in a very fast lane. Morning, I was doing one place. In the afternoon, I'll go and uh, pick up another kitchen on my own. And that's why I was learning two, two things at his, in a day. And it worked for me. And uh, as luck would have it, some of the senior chefs resigned those days. And the shipping lines had just started. Middle East had opened up. And they left on one day. Suddenly, I was only about nine, ten months old and I was told, Hey, where are you? I said, I'm working in so-and-so. Okay. okay, you come down to the banquet kitchen. Start looking after banquet kitchen as a chef. A young lad who's inexperienced, being put as a shift in charge, it was too much of a kind of thing. Average age of the kitchen staff was 50. And you were their boss? Yes, <laughs> and they were not taking it so nicely or liking it. That's why I thought a leader has to be ahead of people. 
then only you can be a good leader. You have to come before them, you have to leave after them. Then you can do a lot more and send the messages also. But what about the craft? I mean, were you able to stand up against all these uh, experienced chefs in terms of the craft and the way you were presenting? Because you said that you were a relatively late entrant as a chef. Yeah. You see, problem was they thought a chef means he is only a warrior, mm. barker, that's it. They never realized that these catering college chefs can cook also. I'm not saying negative or positive for those days, but a kind of uh, some Goan chef cooking North Indian food. You can imagine what will he cook. <laughs> or a North Indian chef cooking a Goan food is way. So how will he cook it? Probably he will put some vendalo into the Rogan Josh and <laughs> some <laughs> mm. makhani coming into the fish goa curry. Mm. But I wanted to learn the right way and learnt it from the masters. Mm. And I must say I respected them a lot, those who were very, very good chefs and learnt from them. So, so I'm, I'm guessing in this there is a lesson that if you want to yes. become a good chef then yeah. this is the path you should follow. Your, and I always say that people who forget their roots, the roots forget them later. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, tell me about Chef Mascarenes. So, you said he taught you the basics or you the focus on basics, yeah. he taught you about sauces. What about life? I mean, how did he, what did he teach you about coping? How, what did he teach you about pressure, making mistakes? Pressures were enough of different ways. Or lessons you learnt yourself in the early days? You know, you had to be good and human to people to learn the art from them, seniors. If you don't respect them, nobody is going to teach you. First is have patience with them to learn the art. And that's what I exactly did. I remember a guy who was so particular in the fish section. I can tell you that till today I have not seen anybody else doing it. If there are two fillets of fish coming in a plate, they were even sized, evenly trimmed, evenly grilled or fried. Mm. The french fries will be of the even size not one centimeter here or there. Today there are frozen french fries, just fry them. Mm. Oh, the generation today is a curry in a hurry. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> so he, he had the patience, a lot of patience to learn the art from them. What would you say are the, are the key lessons that you've in some ways learnt, which I'm assuming are more about leadership than about actually, let's say, running a kitchen, which Someone who comes in young, and I think you've already pointed out some of them. You've talked about the need for patience, the need for uh, perfection, keeping things clean, focusing on, this, on the science before the art. What else did you pick up along the way that you, in, in, you know, principles which you would apply now as you set up your new ventures? I learned at a fast pace. I learned the other things at a very fast pace. I knew I was going to Middle East. So the first thing was to learn the Middle East cuisine. Well, we were zeros. In that, the moment I went there, the first thing was I took the trip to Dubai, Bahrain to see the local cuisine. And uh, in those days, I went to Iraq and Iran to check the cuisine. Mm. And came back and I told one of the guys, you teach me this cuisine. So learn that, so that I could produce that food to all our, because we were handling only heads of state and the VIPs over mm. there. So it was very important that you are getting the president and the prime ministers or the kings of the different countries. And you must be able to produce the best. So you, you touched upon 2611 and that was a turning point for many of us, including those who were watching it or reporting on it as journalists yeah. and you yourself, you were right there. You know, the lessons that you take away from something like that, I mean, which is so unusual because this was never your job to actually protect people. And, yeah. uh, and save lives, but you, but you did that, your colleagues did that, some of them lost their lives. What were the things, you know, and, and I'm sure as you years pass, the, the, the distilled message that you take away changes maybe, maybe in some ways. And if you were to look back today, and as, as I'm sure you do, what, what, are, what do you recall of that day and what is the one or two imprinted lessons that it's left behind? To you I as think a um, life is so unpredictable. Mm. And uh, nobody can change your destiny, no one. If it is written, you have to die on so and so a day, you will die, irrespective of anything. That night, probably the bullet was not made for me. That's why three times 
I survived a distance of about 20 meters, probably I moved and they came to that place in after 5 minutes and um, then they fire a bullet which goes over our heads and hit somebody else. So that's uh, where the destiny is I think uh, and unfortunately my colleagues were in that place and they died. This is about the secret sauce and secret sauce can be many things. It can be the sauce that you actually make, the ones that you've been taught by your predecessors or your mentors or it could be the way you approach life mm -hmm. as a chef. What are your secret sources? I think it is the um, one is almighty of course he is always there. I think one is the support of the family because if you're putting in about 18 hours a day. Yeah. And I've read that you barely get five minutes with yeah. your wife in a day. Yeah. I think she's been a very good support. So I think that's what uh, matters a lot. <laughs> Patience, perseverance and the passion. If you're not passionate, get out of it. There's no way you can do something with it. If you don't cook it from heart with a passion, you will never make good food. By wearing some one earring in one side, <laughs> by shaving off your head, you don't become chefs. It is the heart which cooks the food. It is passion which cooks the food. That's, I guess, is your final secret sauce. Thank you so much for speaking to me, uh, Chef Omendra, and all the best. Thank you so much. All the Thank best you. for your next round of ventures. Thank you so much. Thank you.